Uh, for those of you who are in the team class with Joel, you're probably going to see a lot of the same thing. Um, as they, as the kids were mentioning where they went and what they talked about, I went, "Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's that's in the sermon." And then I accused him of uh, stealing my lesson. He didn't deny it, so. Um, the lesson this morning is about the good news, uh, and more specifically, God's good news. The word gospel, if you've ever heard that before, really means the good news. And in this context, we're not talking about good news. The stock market has gone up. Everybody's 401ks are now 25% larger. No, it's way better news than that. Uh, the retirement plan that God has in mind is much more than just monetary uh, support until you expire at 80 to 90 years old. That's not what God's plan is, is at all. We read about some of the gospel in the book of Romans. Now, this is not going to be an exhaustive The Good News sermon. Uh, we'd be here for a long time. This is just one aspect and what I find to be kind of the core underlying aspect of what's considered the gospel, the good news. And here the author writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So he kind of sums up what the purpose of this good news is for. Now I mentioned a 401k and that the stock market's gone up, and that, that could be good news for those of us that have that. And this good news also has a requirement. With a 401k, you have to actually invest into it. You have to believe that that stock market's going to go up. And historically, over enough time, it has. This retirement plan that God has to offer us also requires belief. The gospel, this good news that the author here is talking about, is the power of God for salvation. And it's available to every person that believes. The next phrase here, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The author here is just pointing out the fact that this gospel, this plan of God, was first available to the Jews. It was offered first to the Jews. Those were the people of God that he chose to be an example to him. And now this author is saying that that also, this plan opened up also to the Greeks. Basically, everybody that isn't a Jew. This plan is available to all people who believe. For in it, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, I heard several comments from the teen class about what faith is. It's, it's something that you have to believe in without having proof. They also mentioned that there were evidence, there was some prophecy, there were things that actually factually came about that the Bible told us was going to happen that gives us evidence that God exists and that his plan will come to fruition. But the author here still says that it is going to be revealed from faith to faith. It is not going to be something that we can go up to God's house, knock on the door, and say, God, prove yourself to me. That's not the way that God set this up. But if we continue here, we'll have a, a little bit more reason for this author as to why he believes in the gospel of God. But the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. In this author's opinion, it is that the creation around us, those things that we can see, those things that we can look out to the night sky, those creatures that are around us, the very existence that we have proves that there is a creator. And it proves it so much that we do not have an excuse. 
Every person at some point in their life will think either, what's the point of all of this? Or, why am I here? How did I get here? Or they'll think both of those things. That's a possibility. And this author says that just by looking out and seeing the creation that is here, we have no excuse to ignore God's reality. So God created all things. In Genesis chapter 1, we can read about the account of how that was done. He created everything that we see around us, all the things that we can see, touch, hear, feel, smell, everything. He created those things. They didn't just come into existence on their own power. Again here, Hebrews chapter 11, for those of you who are in uh, Joel's class this morning, this may be familiar to you. We refer to this as the faith chapter. And if you saw the sign while you drove in this morning, you'll notice that it says, Church of God, faith of Abraham. And there's a reason that we chose that word Abraham, that, that man Abraham, and tried to tie our faith and likeness to that man's faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verses 8 and going through 12, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So this idea here of an inheritance, it's very similar to the idea of a retirement. An inheritance is something that you inherit, something that you're given, something that is gifted to you. And Abraham obeyed because he knew he was going to receive an inheritance. So he went out and he didn't even know where he was going. And by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. So we learn here that this inheritance is an inheritance of promise, a promise that God made to Abraham. And it entails land. It entails an area. It entails ground. And that Isaac and Jacob, through that same promise, were going to inherit the same thing that Abraham was. Land, ground, territory on this earth. Fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Makes sense that if God's going to be the one that offers the uh, retirement plan, that he also is the designer and the builder. So they were looking for this city. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond their proper time of life, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Doesn't make it explicit here, but Sarah was Abraham's wife. And Isaac was their child. And Jacob was his child. Do you see a pattern here? We've got children. In the adult class today, we were talking about uh, a guess of 1985 being when Jesus would come back and establish his kingdom. Well, many of us here today are happy that it wasn't 1985 and that we still have an opportunity to become part of the believers and part of this plan. And that's still the same process. Children being born those that choose to obey God, those that choose to follow God and believe in him, who are looking for a city, those are the ones that God writes into the inheritance will. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. That would include those of us today sitting here that have chosen or that will choose to be part of this family of Abraham. Continuing on, on in Hebrews 11, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So this list of people that we talked about, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, and the descendants that were innumerable like the stars of the sea. It's categorizing these as all these have died 
in faith without having received the promise. None of these people have found that city. None of these people have been granted this inheritance yet. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We'll get back to this city idea here at the end of the lesson today. But just remember that God has prepared this city for them, and none of us, none of them, are going to receive this city. They're not going to receive this inheritance until all of God's children receive it. Further on in Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40, And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Continuing on in the book of Psalm, uh, chapter 37, verses 27 through 29. Now, we talked about a city. We also mentioned that there was a country. We mentioned that there was land in this inheritance. In God's plan, the inheritance plan, the good news is about this earth. It's about this planet. The inheritance is the world that we are living in today. It's going to be remade, but it's still this planet. Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. So yeah, we've got the two choices to make. Either we want to become the descendants of God, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or the descendants of the wicked. And the reward for that is dwelling in the land, inheriting the land and dwelling in it forever. Another name that is mentioned in Hebrews 11 that we didn't read about in this lesson is Daniel. Speaking about prophecy, this prophecy was made to King Nebuchadnezzar. And in it, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a glimpse into the future, all the way from his time up to future to us, about what's going to be the state of the kingdoms of this world and how that's going to play into God's plan. Not just God's plan for the inheritance, but also God's plan for how mankind is going to be conquering the worlds, how mankind is going to be operating on this planet before he sends his son, and how that's going to end, how he intends to turn this over to another kingdom. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image, mighty and exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, so all of the attributes of this image, all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven. 
making you rule over all of them. You are the head of gold. So Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar where his part in this prophecy is, where his kingdom stands. It's the head of gold, the first one that Daniel listed. Another kingdom that's inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. Whoa, I went way too far. There we go. And as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, so the days of the kings of this mixed kingdom, where there's partly strong and there's partly weak, is that what we see today in the world? We see some nations that are strong, some nations that are weak, some, king, some kingdoms that are in, intermingled. We see that in this establishment, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So during this time, we'll go through a little bit about what the other kingdoms are. We know that the head of gold was Babylon. And we know that in this setup where there's iron mixed with clay, that's the time period that God's going to set up his kingdom. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. I think it was Cohen that was talking about uh, some of the prophecies that prophesied that Israel would be a state again, which makes it possible that other prophecies in the Bible can take place. We're going to touch on that exact same thing here next. However, put yourself in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes. He, he doesn't get the benefit that we sitting here today have. He can't look back on history and see the kingdoms we're going to talk about coming up. He doesn't see that. All he knows is that this great God that gave him a vision, that a prophet, Daniel, told him the vision he saw. That's another part of this. Nebuchadnezzar didn't even tell Daniel, hey, this is the dream that I had. Can you explain it to me? No, he said, I had a dream. You need to tell me what it was and what the meaning is. So Daniel does. Nebuchadnezzar does not have the ability like we have to go, oh, yeah, these were the other kingdoms. He didn't get to see that. But the fact that we can look back on this and line up what happened in history with what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar is what adds to our faith. What, it's what adds to the reality that God's plan is going to happen. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. So I pulled this from the internet where I pull just about everything anymore. And we see here Babylon as the head of gold. We see a, a time frame. This is when Nebuchadnezzar was alive. Actually, shortly before 539, Nebuchadnezzar died. He didn't see the day where the second kingdom came into, into existence. Shortly after Nebuchadnezzar passed away, the Medes and the Persians invaded Babylon and took it down. They reigned in that area between 539 and 331. During that time, the Jews that were in captivity 
Daniel was a Jew that was in captivity. During this time, portions of them were sent back to Israel to rebuild. And then Greece takes over from the Medes and Persians from 331 to 168. And then the kingdom of iron, which is what it's known as even in secular history. The kingdom of iron, pagan Rome, comes into power 168 BC to 467 AD. And then we have this divided papal Rome. I don't agree with the time frame there where it ends at 1798, because it's in the days of these kings. Do we still have Rome today? Do we still have the Vatican today? Yes. Do we still have the influences of that religion on the planet today? Yes. Side note, do we have the influences of the false prophet in the world today? We're not going to really touch on that prophecy, but John told us about the false prophet. He told us about the beast, and Daniel told us about this divided kingdom thousands of years ago, and yet here we are, sitting in the ages of these kings, the iron and the clay. The next prophecy that Cohen actually brought up this morning, we're going to talk another, another chapter about this, in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall, be, shall move northward and the other half southward. One thing that Cohen brought up that I hadn't thought of was how this prophecy wouldn't work unless there was an Israel and a Jerusalem, and how this prophecy here is talking about two different prophecies. One, the one that Cohen brought up, Israel would have to be a state again, and Jerusalem would have to be on their, in their power for this prophecy to make sense. And two, this is the fulfillment of the stone hitting the clay and iron foot. This is a depiction of when that happens. Jehovah sends Jesus to fight for him against all the nations of the world. What's the stone do when it hits the foot? It crushes it. And those crushed kingdoms, represented by the iron mixed with clay, are ground to dust and blown away. So in more than just one prophecy, this is fulfilling God's plan. Let's get a little bit more detail about this time frame. In Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 18, John received a vision as the last apostle alive. He received a vision that detailed out more of God's plan. And in it, he says, The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. So this short phrase encapsulates the entire point of the vision that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. It's at this moment that Jesus' feet touch down on the Mount of Olives and wages war against all the nations of this world. It's at this moment that it fulfills the prophecy in Daniel 2. 
And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. So the, the prophecy here, the vision here, shifts back from fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, fulfillment of the image that was destroyed, it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, in Romans chapter 1, that those who believe, those who accept God and will follow him, they're waiting, Hebrews chapter 11, they're waiting for this time where the dead will be judged, the time for the reward of the bondservants, those that work for God, the time for the reward of the prophets and the saints, the time that the inheritance of the land is going to be fulfilled. Those who fear God's name. The time for the destruction of those who destroy the earth. Peter writes these words in 1 Peter. I don't know the chapter because I didn't write it down. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Remember, they're all looking for a country. They're all looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And they won't receive the promise. They won't receive the inheritance until everybody that is God's receives it. Chapter 1, 1 Peter 1. Seems easy. Continuing on in 1 Peter 1. Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth, remember, Abraham was counted faithful because he obeyed. Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brothers and sisters, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again not of seed which is, imp or which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God, the good news of God, the gospel. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers. And the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Yeah, this ties together with the other words that we've read. The salvation of those that are gods, those that are looking for the salvation. The salvation is saved from being dead. This life runs its course and it's over. Our hope and the good news of God is that there is a reward for those that are righteous when he sends his son back to this earth. That reward is the earth, and that reward will be granted to all of God's people at the same time. Now remember, we talked about a city whose builder and maker is God. John, at the end of his vision, receives this information. He sees this in his vision. And I saw the holy city. He sees this city that was promised. He sees this city that Abraham looking, was looking for. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Remember, the promise is of this earth. 
The promise is for the land here. Abraham was promised land, the same land, the same inheritance that Isaac and Jacob and all of the descendants of them would receive. And that is the same thing that John says here. He sees this city coming down from heaven to earth. God will make his dwelling place here with his people. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So as we began this lesson today, Paul told us that this inheritance is is for those who are faithful and that this plan, this gospel is passed through faith. And it's through this faith that God counts us as his. And he guarantees us this faith is going to be upheld on his end of the bargain. When he tells us, write these things down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The gospel of God can be a lot of things, and it does entail a lot of things. We mentioned in this lesson this morning about resurrection. That's another element of how this gospel plan is going to work. We don't have time to go into all of the different details, but the plan of God, the gospel of God, is trustworthy and true. So as we end this morning, if there are those that wish to become part of God's plan, while we sing the last song, they're welcome to come up and join.
Our great God in heaven, we thank you for this day and this one that you've given to us so that she can accept you and start a walk with you. We ask that we are good examples for her and those that are looking for your truth. We ask that you forgive us all when we do fall short and that you reserve us a place in that kingdom that you've promised. These things we ask if it be your will and in Jesus' name, amen.